Life can be a bit of a handful. But what do you do? Let go. Or grab on to everything it has to offer. Ask yourself, do you back down when things get tough? Or confront them, breasts on? Do you give up or give it hell? Do you ignore your amazing boobs or fearlessly check them regularly? We thought so. This is grabbing life by the boobs. So grab regularly and check out any changes. It could save your life. Search Copperfield. Grab life. I'm a feminist, but sometimes I fantasise about being a stereotypically hot 20-year-old screaming in the front row of a Beatles concert and being invited backstage by young Paul McCartney because he likes the way I look in my 1960s miniskirt and fringed waistcoat and knee-high white vinyl boots. And then I think, it's the 60s. Why am I not hanging out with Maya Angelou and Gloria Steinem or writing for the British Adam's Rib feminist magazine? What are you doing here? It's really fun being backstage with Paul McCartney. And I'm like, oh, we start making out. Then I sort of go, I'll get round to feminism later in the 60s. (laughs) Can I please have 64 to 66 for this and then get political around 67 in time for the summer of love? (laughs) But I mean, you really want to be spending the summer of love with Paul McCartney. Listen, he, by that time, will both be mega politicised. Okay. It'll be fine. I'm going to work it out. We can work it out. You, you, you work shouldn't it. have so much guilt in your fantasies. Fantasies are a guilt-free place. Oh, no, not That's mine. the only place... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whatever floats your boat. But no, like, the fantasies are the one place where you can be like, goodbye, feminist theory. <laughs> I'm going to put on this PVC dress. <laughs> Get into this vat of soup. <laughs> and just splash around with a bigot. That's what... <laughs> That's what I'm into. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. I'm sure if you set up a YouTube channel called Splash Around with a Bigot, you would get <laughs> some serious numbers. That sounds like a genuine ITV show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but the first time that I heard about Ariana Grande, I misheard her name and thought her name was Ariola Grande. Uh, <laughs> And so even now when I see her, all I can think is, big nipple. (laughs) Not even that she has big nipples, just she is a big nipple. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but I realised after I wrote that last I'm a feminist, but it wasn't Adam's Rib, British feminist magazine, it was Spare Rib. And I had to look it up. And for years I've been calling it Adam's Rib, which is, as it turns out, a Doris Day (laughs) rom-com. Not a groundbreaking British feminist magazine from the 60s at all. I am a feminist, but I've kind of got to the stage where I want to hire a studio and lots of props and then just have like a whole photo shoot where I take faux spontaneous nudes, just so I have them ready if anyone asks me for nudes. So I'll just be like... (laughs) Here I am at home, yeah. on the farm, DFS. <laughs> like, oh, like I, parody nudes. It, so do you mean if someone asks you on a dating app for nudes? Yeah, well, I've got into a situation where I was, like, sending nude, my first nudes back and forth with someone. But they just had amazing nudes. They had, like, incredible lighting. Like, <laughs> it, like they were, like, kind of tastefully arranged. Oh, so you're going to get some them... tasteful ones, so you don't have to be there in bed going... Oh. Yeah, because I just, like... Also, my, my, like, my selfie camera's really bad. It's, like, fuzzy. I just sort of look, like, static, like, sexy. <laughs> sexy static. And I just, like, the, the lighting's never right. And I always I don't feel think like... this is a bad idea at all. I think this is rather practical. But I, I think you should do some funny parody yeah, ones, no, though. Some parody ones. Also, like, the speed that you send them is important. Yeah. So they're like, where are you? And you're like, oh, I'm at a cake shop. And suddenly it's like, you, with, like, a, <laughs> like a trifle in front of you. No one's going to buy that. No one's no, going to be like, no, oh, you, I've you, just done a selfie no, no, of myself you, with a trifle covering my breasts. You, oh, no, what are you doing right now? Oh, I'm just fixing a car. <laughs> no one's going to yeah, buy that. And then that. you're like grease lightning on the top of like a Ford Focus. No, I think it'd be... I have like, very luxury before seeing these like, photos. Yeah, well, this is great. Just ask me for nudes. <laughs> it'll be like improbably be like, give me a location. Listen, once this podcast goes out, you are going to be inundated. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but if I could resurrect Maya Angelou now, no matter how much we need her, I would not. Because she died under Obama 
And it gives me great comfort that she didn't live to see Trump. And it's the main reason I hope there's no afterlife. <sighs> I mean, the thing is, there may be another Maya. That's the thing. You don't need, like... Is it you? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, it is me. Right. <laughs> Let's hear your final I'm a feminist part. And we'll decide... We'll, um, we, this could be the one. This could be the one that makes us go, <laughs> she's Maya. She's the new... She's the second coming. Oh, yeah. This one is really going to make me seem like a good person. Um... <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I don't trust women who wear silky culottes. Um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think it makes them look like characters from Beauty and the Beast mid-transformation. <laughs> <laughs> like the top half is a beautiful woman, but the bottom half is a silky lampshade. I don't like it. I don't, I don't think we've found Maya yet. I think that's the... <laughs> Live from the Leicester Square Theatre in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Sophie Duca, and very special guests Toby Cherry Martin and Coco Brown talking about seeing and being seen. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, and today I'm joined by Sophie Duker talking about seeing and being seen. Uh, so tell me, have you had a guilty week or a feminist week? Oh, uh, I think I've had a, um, a feminist week. Have you had a feminist week? Why? Yeah, um, <laughs> a lot of early rising which I feel you've got to wake early to catch the patriarchy. Um, <laughs> do you feel like I've been very... more feminist if you get out of bed early and get on with the day? That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I do. I know, I know like, as a feminist, it is my right to have a life. Self-care. Self-care. Because sure. <laughs> I'm Gen X, and in my day, self-care was self-indulgence. Mm. And it's not anymore. I mean, I like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm right in on that one. I'm like, sure, I can't come to your party. Self-care. <laughs> yeah. But do you know, it's, it's quite a new concept, self-care. The thing is, I feel like now almost anything can be self-care. So, like, saying, no, I'm not going to your party can be self-care, but also just um, eating what you like can be self-care. Yes. I don't know. I feel like I'm taking care of myself because I'm not lying to myself. Right. I'm not like, if I oh, watch I st- I- all of the chilling adventures of Sabrina again, <laughs> my life is going to be better tomorrow. Yeah. Um, self-care, so, self-care. Yeah, self-care. Yeah. I'm quite confused by self-care because I know that yoga can be self-care. It but, can. Yeah, but <laughs> I also know Love Island can be self-care for some people. <laughs> but I think we do lie to ourselves about self-care. I think some things are more self-care than others. Mm-hmm. Some things are just self-destruction labelled as self-care. Um, I mean, for me, watching Love Island would be self-harm, but I, <laughs> I appreciate that. It's a fun show. It's a nice show. Oh, yeah, people yeah. love it. People love it. I haven't plugged in, but I hear from some very intelligent people that there's something, I don't know, some people say, well, it's interesting psychologically and there are some parts that are really feminist. No, nah, they're just already fit. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you'll hear more from Sophie Duke this evening, cutting through the bullshit. Um, so, Sophie. Yes. Yeah, how do you feel about seeing and being seen? Do you feel as a woman that you feel comfortable being seen? Were you taught as a child to disappear a bit have you always been someone I mean you're a performer have you always been someone who's liked to be seen I have recently really liked to be seen so I'm wearing a very loud colour tonight you can mm. probably hear it on the podcast um, I like wearing loud colours I like going into places and having people be like there she is but that doesn't always happen because I work with a lot of men a lot of the time and uh, they don't they're not very good at necessarily like acknowledging you when you walk into a room mm. they just sort of like grunt or stare or like look into it. So I'm always very like overtly trying to push myself into people's line of vision and be like, hey, how was your weekend? And they turn away and look at the other, something else. So I feel like I have to put myself in front of people's eyes quite a lot. Do you feel that uh, you are better now as you get older and as you get more, not that you're old, but as you, <laughs> you know, as you develop in your career, that you're better at being seeing it, being getting into the eye lines? Yeah, I think I am. I think also, even though I like to make sure people can see me, I don't feel like it's as urgent anymore. Because I was like, do I exist? Do I exist? And, and it was like, but now I'm like, I definitely exist. I would like people to see me so that we can you know, acknowledge each other. But it's not as like a desperate need to be seen immediately. I think that might be an age thing as well, because I definitely felt that when I was younger. I felt quite invisible. And I think sometimes people look at me now and think, oh, well, you have this podcast, you're up on stage, you're confident... But when I first came to this country, 
and I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, which I've talked about on the podcast many times, so I, I will not bore you with the details of that. But the cult-like nature, or the high control group nature of that organisation meant it was very, very difficult for me to, when I decided to leave it, I started going to improv class, which is something I'd done secretly when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And then when the elders had found out, we weren't allowed to do it anymore because it was fun. And, um, <laughs> there's, uh, and so I went to improv class when I left. And I felt like everyone was ahead of me. And I also felt like I didn't quite know how to connect to other human beings without a doorframe between us or a coded thing. Like, if you go to the Kingdom Hall, everyone's sort of got to interact. That's part of being at the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. Like, there's a certain amount of connection that's required. And other than that, you knock on people's doors. And that's how you interact with people. And when you're working with somebody in a secular way, you're meant to keep a distance and not go for a coffee with anyone or anything like that. So I found it very difficult to connect. And I remember going to improv classes in Leicester Square, actually, really close to here. There was the theatre. We used to use the Tristan Bates in Covent Garden, part of the Actors' Centre, and that's where we used to do shows. I remember at the interval of the improv show that, I mean, I wasn't invited to do the show. I wasn't that grand. I was just watching what were called the senior players. We were called rookies. It it was a class-based system, I'll be honest. And, uh, (laughs) And I used to go and hide in the loo in the interval and, like, read a book in the loo. Oh, no. Yeah. I did that. I mean, not your improv classes. No. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, when I was little and shy at school, I used to go and read books in the toilet because, you know, the library was too social. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember that. And it was because it was before we had smartphones. So then we used to have books. And... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> They had pages. It was a How good different time. How do you put type. them on an f- airplane mode? <laughs> <laughs> well, you... you <laughs> Airplane mode came standard in books and okay. still does. Um, it, it, you can't crush a plane with that. But I remember doing that and I remember not having any friends because you weren't allowed to talk to your old friends. And I remember going a whole weekend and speaking when I wasn't working from Friday night to Monday morning speaking to literally nobody. And I remember once organising a coffee with someone from the improv class. And it was a Sunday afternoon thing and she was probably hungover or something. And she just was like, you know how you cancel on someone on a Sunday? It's fair enough to cancel yeah. on anyone on a Sunday. They're the rules, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Self-care, yeah. Self-care. Yeah, she cancelled on me for self-care, although in those days it was just cancelling. And, uh, and I remember crying because she was the only person I was going to talk to all weekend. And so, yeah, so Ooh. the reason I'm saying this is not so you feel sorry for me. I'm saying it because I think sometimes people see me and think, oh, well, you were just born confident mm. and you were just born able to kind of, you know, throw your energy out to all of these different people. But that is not true at all. And I think... I say it because I've been listening a lot to Elizabeth Day's podcast, How to Fail. You know, there's all these inaccessibly glamorous people on the show and you realise a lot of them did not know how to see and be seen. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, you know, they've won a man book a prize or they've run a small country or a large company or something. And (laughs) you think, do you know what I mean by this? I want it to be encouraging and I feel I've just been depressing. (laughs) I think, I think the thing that's interesting about that is that people probably weren't seeing that you needed friends, like you needed people to talk to. Like, you need to learn how to, like, manifest. Like, I need you to meet me. I don't mm. care that it's a Sunday. I need you to meet me today because we're going to be friends and have that coffee. And, yeah. Yeah, I think I just didn't know how to do normal things. And it turns out years later, that friend, I told her I was a Jehovah's Witness because I wasn't telling anyone at the time because I didn't want to be identified that way. I felt mm. like I'd been in that people had seen me that way for so long and I just desperately needed people not to see me that way because it's a very, very patriarchal cult and it's run by men. So uh, the reason I say it is because I've sort of really pushed past that now and I don't have any problem seeing and being seen. I don't get nervous backstage. I'm really looking forward to coming out onto the stage. And so the reason I say it is if you're somebody who feels nervous or feels like I can't really do feminism very well because I know I need to speak up and I need to be like visible for feminism and how will I ever get there uh, the answer is keep turning up yeah. that's what I think I'm very inspired by you because you're very young and I've made an assumption <laughs> I mean everyone is at some point <laughs> very young. I'm so inspired by the amount of time you've been on the earth Thank uh, you. no but I feel like your confidence radiates out and you're very young I don't know how old you are and I don't want to force you to say it on stage. Okay. But I feel like you're in your 20s. I am. Yes. Okay, good. I'm like Ten Darren points. Brown of ageing. <laughs> and I feel like you're in your 20s, but you already have that. I saw you perform in Edinburgh and you were just like completely owning the stage. You know, you were kind of, in a way, crushing the audience, but in a really gentle, <laughs> it was a gentle crush. A gentle crush. Like a I loving felt, crush. I felt almost like a kitten being picked up by the scruff of the neck. 
like when the mother picks the kidnap. <laughs> That's how I felt you were with the audience. I felt like, ah. Oh. This is a, the best comedy review I've ever had. You'll feel like a kitten. <laughs> um, that was so nice. I actually think, well, okay, I, I've, people say that I seem very confident on stage, but sometimes it's been used like a bit of a diss. Like, people are like, oh, you seem very confident for someone so young. Or you seem, like, very confident. Like, how long have you been doing stand-up? And I'm just like, I'm pretending to be confident. No. Like, that's what everyone... Like, everyone gets on stage, they pretend to be like, don't criticise me for doing something well. Just, mm. like, be like... Pretend, I don't know. It's Do a, people say that? Yeah, people have said that. Wow. They sort of say, like, you seem very confident. Like, oh, What's very that confident. based on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you're like, you really back yourself. And I'm like, oh, y- yes. You really back yourself. That is such a thing. You would never say that to a man, would you? You wouldn't go... You really believe in yourself, don't you? Mm. Why? Because <laughs> I can't see any reason for it. <laughs> but it's good that you do, because no one else does. It's like, what? Why would you say that to somebody? I know, but I think, like, feeling the confidence, like, feeling, like, comfortable on stage and comfortable with people is something that's been really nice. Mm. Um, because you're like, I'm at home. I, I see people, I see people in the audience, and I'm like, yes, like, I would want to come and see a show like this. I would want to be spoken to by someone like me. So it's a nice mm. thing. I'm glad that you liked being crushed like a kitten. I, yeah, I just feel so much more of an obligation to see and be seen now, to sort of see women, to sort of especially see women who uh, have their identities intersect in ways that are more marginalised than mine. I feel I have this obligation now to look at hard things that I suppose I didn't five years ago. No, I do, I do. To, like, look at things. You know when you see things come up on Facebook and you go, oh, I can't handle that? I know I have to look at Yemen, for example, and I'm finding it hard. I'm going to put it out there and say I'm finding it hard to look at Yemen. I'm looking at so many other hard things. I'm looking at refugees loads. I've started looking at homelessness. I'm looking at those things. They're hard. They're hard to look at. And I, I can't engage with them unless I look at them. I find it really hard to look at Yemen. I'm finding it really hard to look at animal rights. It's okay to find it hard. I think it's okay to say you find it hard. And I'm also aware, like, I can only take so much, like... The human brain, I don't think, is meant to take as many images, positive and negative, as we take in in a single minute now. So I don't blame myself for it, but I have to get around to really engaging with Yemen because yeah, it's I so think, hard. I think your brain images. tries to protect yourself so you don't actually see terrible things. Like, I was walking with my friend once and she was like, oh, look, it's such a cute little dog. It's so it's adorable. And I was like, it's a dog with a homeless person who you've completely not oh, yeah. seen. And I think you just get so used to seeing like pain or terrible things that you stop sometimes just engaging with you stop seeing it it becomes invisible mm. to you and you have to train yourself and be like no I've got to look for these things mm-hmm. because if I'm in a place where I can help then I mm. should I was like don't, well, it is a cute dog but come on <laughs> yeah yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. no I, absolutely and we just don't we, it's like selective cataracts almost mm. it's like we go oh look at the dog I don't really want to deal with the fact that, that person's homeless and I've got someone to live I feel I need to see in a way because I'm someone who is seen And so I can talk about the things that I see because people will look at me sometimes when they won't look at Yemen. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And I think everyone here in this room, in a way, is a person of influence. I truly believe that. Because people don't come to podcast recordings unless they're people of influence. Because you don't even have a podcast. You don't find a podcast. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't... You're not in that world. So we're all people who are seen by virtue of the fact that we've made it here today. We're sitting in a nice red velvet seat in a lovely theatre in the West End. So therefore, we have a platform. I guess what this episode might be about, I'm coming to, I don't know, is if we are prepared to see the difficult things and the wonderful things and then act like a screen on which those things can be projected and then the people that will look at us, we can tell them about this, we can shine a light on that, then it's worth us being seen. It's not really worth us being seen if all we're ever going to talk about is contouring and cats. Um, Both valid things. Nothing wrong with contouring, nothing wrong with cats. But if that's our only thing that we're projecting back out into the world, I question that when we are people of influence. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. But I think if you were contouring on cats, (laughs) that can be your whole platform. (laughs) Listen, what are you writing on those cats? Oh, yeah. Secret messages about Yemen. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly. If you're prepared, <laughs> listen, if you're prepared to contour a political message onto a cat, I am with you. <laughs> All right, are you ready for some stand up comedy? <laughs> then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Sophie Chuka. <laughs> Can 
everybody feel me? <laughs> Ooh, okay, the correct answer is not without my express consent. All right. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to do some chatting on the theme of uh, see and be seen. Um, I just want to say uh, very quickly, last time I was on The Guilty Feminist, I was not out. I mean, I was, but I was uh, not out to my mum. Uh, so I'm very excited to be on The Guilty Feminist and say that I am a queer woman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and that bitch. Hey. <laughs> uh, it's very exciting to be here. Um, I wanted to, um, since it's the thing of seeing and being seen and uh, being reflected is very exciting for me as an entertainer, I want to tell you uh, some facts about myself so you get a little bit of a sense of my character. So the first fact that I want to tell you lovely people today is that I am an eldest child. Ooh, some woos. Do we have any eldest children in the audience? Yeah. Okay, I love eldest children because you guys are leaders, but you're reluctant leaders. You've got leaderness <laughs> thrust upon you. Have we got any younger children in the audience? Yeah. Ooh, always louder, you smug pricks. <laughs> uh, middle children, I would ask you to cheer, but as we all know, you're not important. <laughs> <laughs> the second fact that I want to tell you about myself, some of the more spiritual of you will already have picked up on. I am an Aquarius <laughs> born in the year of the horse. Mm, an Aquarius born in the year of the horse. What could that mean? Nothing. It's bullshit. <laughs> last fact, possibly the most exciting fact, is that I am a very notable, not a white guy. Oh, thank you. Have you got any white guys in? <laughs> Come on, guys. Cheer louder. We know how much you get paid. White guys. <laughs> All right, guys. Is there a minute? White guy. Do you identify as a white guy? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I don't mean to pick on the white guy in the audience because I like... I've, I've got anything against you. I genuinely love white men. Love your work. Bob Dylan. <laughs> It's very exciting. I don't have anything at all against white men, apart from, obviously, everything it is that they've done. <laughs> Some of my best friends. <laughs> Some of my best... <laughs> my best friends are white men. My mother is a white man. Um, but the reason, the reason I speak to you, and I, I promise I'm not, I'm not going to be mean to you at all, the reason I speak to you is because I want to know what is it like uh, being a white man at the moment for you? Difficult. <laughs> I would say so. Um, no, it is. It's, I think it's a weird time uh, for white men because they were always the ones that got to see and be seen. Like, but now, like, they're feeling increasingly under threat. Like, you know, like the rhino and the shark. Great white men going extinct. <laughs> <laughs> difficult to deal with because like the world is changing and as like a queer woman of colour like white men are saying like oh Sophie we like want to be you we want to be like you which I find strange because I am very short um, <laughs> and I think it's amazing like the way the world has changed the way that different people are being seen and I think this year someone at the BBC said that if you're going to put together a team like now in 2018 if you're going to put together a team it's not going to be six Oxbridge white blokes. It's not going to be six Oxbridge white blokes. It's going to be a diverse range of people that represent the modern world. Isn't that amazing? A diverse range of people that represent the modern world. And quite right too, because in the past, there were no black people. <laughs> I don't know what he means by that. I don't know why people still think that Diversity is like a modern thing. I don't know if this guy thinks that black people are a thing that literally just happened, like fidget spinners. <laughs> or that black people are a thing that keep coming in and out like flares. <laughs> I think that he thinks that black people were a thing that happened like ages ago, but then they just like went away for a long time and they've only just come back. So like tens of dozens of hundreds of thousands of years ago, the last black man strolled across the prehistoric plain and then slipped and fell in a hole and got frozen in ice and then got defrosted on the 1st of August, 1937, and his name was Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important for me to see and be seen because when I was little, I was so jealous of all the amazing role models that little white girls have. I mean, like, little white girls have so many erasing... Um, erasing? <laughs> they shave often. Uh, <laughs> Well, there's so many amazing role models like Hillary Clinton, Emma Watson, Peppa Pig, but I <laughs> didn't have that. And because of that, I ended up over-identifying with anyone who was brown who wasn't on Crime Watch. Like, and even now, 
even now I end up over identifying with people because of the colour of their skin. So I see people like the Olympian, Nicola Adams, and I see her and I think, oh, great. I too can be a boxer. <laughs> You know, or I see someone like the comedian Lenny Henry and I think, oh, great, I too could be Ainsley Harriet. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I've been Sophie Duke. You've been lovely. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah Francis White here, just letting you know that this Wednesday, the 14th of August, I am going to be in conversation with May Martin at the National Theatre at 7.30 p.m. We are going to be talking about sexuality. We're going to be talking about identity. We're going to be talking about May Martin's new book, and we're going to be talking about her new Netflix show and all of the great, juicy, crunchy themes therein. May and I are both going to be signing copies of our books, so come along Say hi, get your book signed, get a selfie. It will be loads of fun. Go to nationaltheatre.org.uk for tickets. Sunday, 24th of August, it's the Secret Policeman's Tour at the Edinburgh Playhouse. That's right, the Guilty Feminist and Amnesty International have come together to resurrect this incredibly legendary comedy brand. Our show on the 24th of August will feature me hosting Rachel Paris, Nish Kumar, Phoebe Robinson from Two Dope Queens, what? Sindhu V, Desiree Birch, Holly McNish, Rosie Jones, Steve Alley, Jessica Fosterkew, Sophie Duca, with music from Jess Robinson and Grace Petrie. And what's more, if you like Derry Girls, well, Siobhan McSweeney, Saoirse Monica Jackson and Louisa Harlan will be there doing a sketch. Oh my God, it's too much. Go to atgtickets.com it's worth coming up to Edinburgh just for that show, I reckon. But while you're up there, why not catch the solo hours of so many wonderful Guilty Feminist alumni? So many brilliant women are up there doing their shows this year. Go to guiltyfeminist.com and check out where they all are. Now we've got a very exciting announcement. We're doing a crossover season. That's right. We're mashing up the Guilty Feminist with some other podcasts. We're doing on August 30th. No such thing as a Guilty Feminist. That's no such thing as a fish. And us mashed up. We're mashing up with Hoovering in The Hungry Feminist. On August 31st, we're doing All Killer, No Feminism. And Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast known as Rulahistapagafa. On the 1st of September, we're doing The Feminist Bugle and Drunk Guilty Feminist Solving Crime. All of these are at King's Place in London and you can go to kingsplace.co.uk for tickets. I'm sorry to say some shows have already sold out, but there are still tickets for others. But get in now before they all go. Global Pillage is back. That's right. It's at the London Podcast Festival at King's Place on Sunday, the 8th of September at 4.30pm. Go to kingsplace.co.uk for tickets for our very own diversity-based comedy panel show. Also, my book has got a brand new cover and two new interviews with Hannah Gadsby and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Get it now. You can have it in paperback, e-back or audio. Let me read it to you like I'm just doing a podcast, except there's nine hours of content extra for your commute. And now remember we did that episode where Ashling B talked about her show This Way Up and the themes of loneliness. Well, it's out if you're on the UK and Channel 4 weekly, or you can go to all four and binge it all. I just did that. I have to say it was like a masterclass of nuanced, devastating hilarity. One of the best shows I've ever seen. Episode four is genuinely one of the best half hours I've ever seen on television. Go and watch it right now. Here's a sneaky peek to whet your appetite. You never told me there was a man on the go. Oh, mummy. Well, mummy, Richard is Anya's elderly lover. Oh, elderly sorry, sorry, he's lover. the same age as Do you think he might want to go on the mother too? Don't miss Ashling B's brand new comedy, This Way Up, on Channel 4. Stream the full series now on All 4. Welcome to the stage, the wonderful Deborah Francis White! So for seeing and being seen, I'm going to read you a little bit of my book from a chapter called The Power of Yes. I'm a feminist, but sometimes if I'm talking to another feminist, I agree with her, even if I don't think she's right, because I want her to like me. <laughs> Call me 
Tallulah, darling. In 1962, when the actress and wit Tallulah Bankhead was 60 years old, she felt like singing Bye Bye Blackbird to an audience. So she threw a spontaneous party to make that happen. She was, of course, very wealthy by then, but she had always behaved this way. In 1923, at the age of 21, she was an aspiring actress who'd had no particular success in New York. She was cast in a London play called The Dancers, based solely on her photograph and a recommendation. The producer got cold feet and sent her a telegram telling her not to come. She ignored it, borrowed money for the fare, got on the boat and talked her way past customs, who told her she had to report to the police station in the morning as she had no visa, money or evidence of an employer in Britain. She arrived in the West End ready for work. Didn't you get my cable telling you not to come, said the producer. What cable, said Tallulah. Since she'd come all that way, he gave her the job. Tallulah's father was a respectable American senator who had warned her of the dangers of men and alcohol, but as Tallulah often observed, never said a word about women and cocaine. <laughs> Tallulah was a proud, adventurous, queer woman and identified as ambisextrous. She often opened the door dressed only in pearls and said at parties, what's the matter, darling? Don't you recognize me with my clothes on? She'd often say that to aristocratic men when their wives were standing next to them. <laughs> um, brilliant. She was the orgasmic embodiment of sex positivity. She was a big hit in the dancers and soon became a West End star with a huge following of young, working class and queer women who'd often queue overnight to get penny tickets. Her fans were called the Gallery Girls. Some of them worked as her personal assistants and became close friends. She was a forerunner to Lady Gaga. Tallulah Bankhead is my favorite guilty feminist from history. She was fierce, independent, and ran every room she was in. She was also superficial, vain, and hedonistic. She often remarked that she had no idea where her next magnum of champagne was coming from. <laughs> she loved to drive, which was the exciting new technology, but she was very bad at directions, so she would hail a taxi and ask the driver if she could follow behind. Her legendary parties were attended by people of different races, classes, gender expressions, and sexual orientations. She once said, if I had to live my life again, I'd make all the same mistakes, only sooner. <laughs> Tallulah lived her life as one big yes. Not everyone has the freedom from responsibility or access to cash that allows them Tallulah's lifestyle. No one can talk their way past border control anymore. But the spirit with which she lived, the desire to see and be seen without apology or embarrassment is something we could all borrow. She had no shame about her sexuality, which was extraordinary for a woman in the 1920s and is fairly rare now. Think about how many things you'd like to say and do, how much self-expression you're hiding because of what other people might think. Think about the boldness with which you could live if you talked, walked, danced, and dressed like the bravest part of you. Sometimes when we stop caring what other people think, other people think we're wonderful. Sometimes we have plenty of confidence to do the things society approves of competently and be happy to be center stage, as long as we are conforming. I am talking about having the freedom to live large without validation, to try new things that seem dangerous in some way, and to swim against the stream just because it makes us feel whole. Most of us are scared of ourselves. That's the biggest win the patriarchy has made through undermining generations of women, keeping their top-class brains away from books, their wit under house arrest, and their intentions in the dark. Consequently, we, the great-granddaughters of anxious women, can be fearful of the voice inside of us that does not wish to conform and play nice, and so we mostly keep it in check. Many of us are living at half-mast. We are quieter than we want to be. We carry tension in our body because we swallow our opinions. We hunch to make ourselves smaller. We laugh less than we could. We make funny faces in photos to hide our true selves. We pretend we are happy when we are not. We have inadequate sex. We lie about who we are and what we want. British author, journalist, and wordsmith Rebecca West once said, people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. She also wrote, 
Only part of us is sane. Only part of us loves pleasure and the longer day of happiness. Wants to live to our 90s and die in peace in a house that we built that shall shelter those who come after us. The other half of us is nearly mad. It prefers the disagreeable to the agreeable, loves pain and its darker nights despair, and wants to die in a catastrophe that will set life back to its beginnings and leave nothing of our house save its blackened foundations. We pretend all the time that we are content with the longer day of happiness and deny that sometimes we love pain and to scream at the sky and take up space and demand attention and request affection. Tallulah Bankhead only left her most beautiful dress in the wardrobe when she came to the party naked. One day I hope to be brave enough to throw a spontaneous celebration because I feel like singing Bye Bye Blackbird. We need to practice leaving the house in the piece of perhaps metaphorical clothing that is most us until it's all we know how to wear, or at least until we know how to shake it when we want to. We need to say yes to being on panels and speaking on topics on which we are not experts, but about which we can make educated guesses until that becomes fun for us. We need to be and invent the change we wish to see in the world because we are sure we are the best woman to do that. Ask people out and get used to them saying no, and even more scarily, yes. We need to invite people around for feminist choir practice and do a spontaneous photo shoot with a dressing up box when they're there, or maybe a naked one. (laughs) We need to learn from the queer community, if we are not already in it, to get our glitter on and turn the tunes up. Let's tell the world we never received the cable that said don't come and turn up anyway, shameless and ready for work. What cable? Thank you very much. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah. Just wanting you to know that there's some very exciting things coming up. On August the 24th, we're at the Edinburgh Playhouse. That's next Saturday night uh, for the Secret Policeman's Tour, which is a Guilty Feminist and Amnesty International show. It is going to be a riotous night for human rights. Really, really don't miss it. I know I'm biased, but I really do think it's going to be the show of the fringe. No exaggeration. I'm hosting and we have some very special guests, including Rachel Paris, Nish Kumar, Phoebe Robinson from Two Dope Queens, Sindhu V, Desiree Birch, Holly McNish, Rosie Jones, Jessica Fosterkew, Sophie Duker, Grace Petrie, Steve Alley and Jess Robinson. In addition... Siobhan McSweeney, Saoirse Monica Jackson, Jamie Lee O'Donnell and Louisa Harland, who are Sister Michael and Erin Michelle and Orla from Dairy Girls, are going to do a very special, exciting performance. Nish Kumar and Rachel Paris are going to do an exciting performance. Rachel Paris and Grace Petrie are going to do an exciting performance. We've really, really got some treats in store for you, including the four Yorkshire women really, really don't miss this show. Go up to Edinburgh, especially if you have to for it. It's going to be a true wonder. Get tickets at atgtickets.com, but get them now. They're selling fast. We have a Guilty Feminist crossover podcast season. That's right. We're mashing up the Guilty Feminist with some of your favourite podcasts and we're performing them live at King's Place in London, from Friday the 30th of August to Sunday the 1st of September. It's a long weekend of podcast mashups. Friday, we have No Such Thing as a Guilty Feminist. That's us and No Such Thing as a Fish. Also Friday, we have The Hungry Feminist, which is us and Jessica Foster Q, the toast of Edinburgh Festival this year, doing a mashup of us and hoovering. On Saturday, we've got All Killer No Feminism. That's us and All Killer No Filler. Plus, Rilla Histapa Guffer, which is us plus Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. An unlikely pairing and one that's going to be riotous. On Sunday, we have The Feminist Bugle. That's us and The Bugle. If you're terrified of the news and you love feminism, that one's for you. And finally, on Sunday, Drunk Guilty Feminist Solving Crime. You can get tickets for all of those at kingsplace.co.uk. And on the 8th of September... I will be in conversation with Sarah Pascoe for her new book at 7.30pm, Queen Elizabeth Hall. It's going to be very exciting. We'll both be signing our books afterwards. You can come up and meet us and say hi. Her new book is truly, truly fascinating. It's called Sex, Power, Money. If you came along to the May Martin one at the National, you'll know it's a really great night. You can get tickets at southbankcentre.co.uk. And finally, my book is out in paperback with a sexy new cover and brand new interviews from Hannah Gadsby and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Get in there and get yourself a copy. 
If you'd prefer, there's an ebook, or if you'd like me to read it to you while you lie in a hammock and eat grapes, there's an audio book. You can find links to the book and everything I've just told you about at guiltyfeminist.com. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at dfdubs, D-F-D-U-B-Z, and on Twitter at Deborah F-W, and on Instagram, The Guilty Feminist, and on Twitter at Guilt Fem Pod to make sure you're up to date with everything that's happening. We're very busy at the moment. We're doing lots of exciting things, so don't miss anything. Get involved and uh, follow us on social media. And also, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. It really helps other people find it. And uh, give it five stars. Back to the podcast. Our first guest today is the founder of the Black Ticket Project, an initiative offering young black people free tickets to theatre shows in London, as well as being an extraordinary theatre director and producer. Please welcome Toby Cherry Martin. Wonderful, and we can't wait to talk to you in a little bit. But first, we have to bring to the stage our second wonderful guest. She is a theatre maker. She's a vocal artist. She's a spoken word performer. Put your hands together and welcome to the mic to perform the wonderful Coco Brown! Hi, my name's Coco. I'm not funny like these guys, so I'm just going to say some like poetry stuff. Is that okay? Okay, good. That would have been so awkward if everyone was like, nah, give it a miss. <laughs> Hard pass, actually. Um, okay, I'm going to do two pieces for you. The first one that I'm going to do is from a show that I'm making called Grey, which is about depression and black women's mental health. And it's fully BSL, which is British Sign Language Integrated. I don't have my other performer with me who does all the BSL, so I feel really lonely, but it's okay. She said it was okay for me to do this, thank goodness. So I'm going to do that one first, and then I'll do a second one, because that's usually how doing two poems works. <laughs> um, this is called Strong Independent Black Women. So, what have you got to be sad about when you are a strong, adjective, definition, able to withstand force, pressure, or wear, having the power to move heavy objects or perform other physically demanding tasks, true. It's tasking to be a woman. A little more to be a black woman, to always be that woman, the strong woman, better do no wrong woman, always being wronged woman. What have you got to be mad about? I got a lot to be mad about. Solange told you so. <laughs> Though I'll get over it again and 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 against all odds, I'll pull through. Probably. Just know there'll be more women being strong for you, strong with you, strong black women without you. Who would the world shit on? So, what have you got to be sad about when you are a strong, independent, adjective, definition, separate? Not depending on another for livelihood or sustenance. Starving to see yourself in TV, in magazines, on the big screen. What do you mean you can't be seen? No, Beyonce doesn't count. No, Roots doesn't count. No, 12 Years a Slave doesn't count. No, The Maid in that historical series doesn't count because when you are only seen as a slave or the sassy sister with an A or the girl whose one line is, hey or you get less than a line. You get the ever-glorious, mm-hmm. Mm. So, what have you got to be sad about when you are a strong, independent, black? Adjective. Definition of the very darkest color, owing to the absence of light. Always aggressive in the absence of light. Perpetually tough in the absence of light, sharp-tongued in the absence of light, gifts of wagging fingers in the absence of light, missing for six weeks in the absence of light, missing for six months in the absence of light, missing for six 
years in the absence of light. You're sassy, beastly, angry, unhuman, unfeminine, uniquely indestructible, unprotected in the absence of light. You are only ever seen in the absence of light. So what have you got to be sad about when you are strong, independent, black, adjective, definition of the very darkest color owing to the absence of light or the complete absorption of it? And so, I'll remind myself that I am light, that I am love, that I am whole, that I am enough, that I am weakness and strength, that I have a weight on my back, but I have balloons tied to my mind to remind myself to keep my head high. I may not always be strong, but I have strength, although my fragility sings a high C in the ears of anyone that will listen. And so I will remind you, strong, independent black women, that you are light, that you are love, that you are whole, that you are enough. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I do, Deborah introduced me as a vocal artist. That was like how you describe, I've never described myself like that. I love it because it's like, I ain't a singer, I just kind of make sounds with my mouth. And that's like, that's what I do. So a vocal artist is nice. I'm going to put that down. So usually when I do poetry, I do it with my loop station. Uh, my loop station is like an additional limb. I love her. She's called Lulu. I have two, but I love one more than the other. But that's fine because I paid for them. They're not my kids. Um, <laughs> I usually do it with a loop station. So I do music and backing. And this, t I don't have it. I, I ain't got it for the people who can't see. I ain't got it. I'm not lying. Um, so this piece that I'm going to do is called I Was a Tree. I do it just because I like it. And usually it has a lot of like music stuff with it, but I ain't got the loop station, so I ain't gonna do the music stuff today. If you wanna see it with music stuff, you can find it somewhere online if you, I don't know, search my name or something. Like, I don't, I don't know how people find people on the internet, but if you search my name, you'll probably be able to find it with the music. But I'm gonna do it without it. This is called I Was a Tree. I was a tree. Tall and proud, I was rooted in my ground. We fell in love in the summer. You fell in love with my leaves and flowers. You fell in love with how I caught the sun, how I held it in my arms. You fell in love with how I caught the breeze, how I gave you oxygen, how I provided you with space to breathe. In the summer, you fell in love with me. And then autumn came and my leaves fell and my flowers disappeared and I realized that you couldn't see my roots. You didn't see my branches in the summer. You didn't know that I was hard and tough, but breakable. You didn't know that I could be so exposed, so barren, so bare. And you realized there, then, that you didn't know my roots. I was a tree and I let the harsh winter demolish me. I thought I was a tree. I was surprised when I realized that I wasn't just a tree, no. I was the entire fucking garden. I was feeding you, nourishing the weeds, letting them flourish, distracted by the flowers that grew, cropping up in corners. I let you infest me. Somehow I let you take over until spring arrived. And I started fighting. I pushed you out. I forced you out. I would not let you kill the roses or the dandelions or the tulips. I would not let you destroy the flower beds. I would not let you destroy where my sanity rests. You see, I thought I was a tree. But I was the entire fucking garden. Thank you. Coco Brown, everybody! Thank you, Coco. That was just wonderful. Absolutely fabulous. Um, so, the reason I've asked both of you today is because I feel like you're both people who are playing in spaces and drawing people into spaces who wouldn't otherwise be there. So it's not just some kind of bubble of posh people entertaining each other. 
So could you tell us something about your work, Toby, and also the Black Ticket Project, which I think is just so phenomenal? Yeah, thank you. In a nutshell, I've been working in theatre since I was 16. I started at Overhouse Theatre, big up Overhouse, um, <laughs> as a young associate. And then after college, I went and did an apprenticeship at Battersea Art Centre and then became junior producer at Battersea Art Centre. So I was there for about three and a half years, then left to work for an organisation called Apples and Snakes that works with poets, but also in that time worked with the Old Vic Theatre for a year. At the moment, I'm at the Bush Theatre so I've kind of just hopped around in lots of different places in a bit of an unconventional way. And I think producing as well is quite an unconventional. No one really knows what producing is. No, um, what is it? I don't know. Like, I can't really... <laughs> I don't know if how you to... you don't know, then nobody knows. Yeah, you just do stuff. You just pull it together. And then it happens. It. Yeah. And it's like, so, like, being a producer is like being a scammer. Yeah, it can be. You do, like, spend other people's money... Which is like, I like it. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm into it. So you find other people's money and put on uh, performances <laughs> I try that it. you believe is worthy work to put in the world. Mm. And what's the Black Ticket Project? So in 2017, a really great play called Barbershop Chronicles was on at the National Theatre. <laughs> Woo! Shout out to Inua. So I love that play. And I went to see it the first time it was at the National. And it was still a very kind of white National Theatre audience who trust the work there, so will buy tickets for anything. And watching that show, I was sort of like, you know, my dad and my brothers would love to see this. Like I went to the barbershop with them a lot when I was younger. And so I bought a bunch of tickets and kind of gave them out to young black men to see the play. I think only like 30 tickets. And then Nine Night was on at the National Theatre after that um, by Natasha Gordon. And so I went back to the National and was like, this is what I did for Barbershop Chronicles. I did, they didn't know. I didn't tell them. Um, so with Nine Night, I was like, I want to do something proper and bigger and better. And so we were aiming to get about 50 young black people to see that show and, and put out a crowdfunder because my friends were like, stop spending money you don't have on things. Um, <laughs> which is true, I'm broke. Um, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so we put out a crowdfunder and ended up crowdfunding enough to take 250 black young people Aww. to see Nine Night, which was amazing. And then it kind of just grew from there, really. Why do you think it is that like, black people don't f- buy tickets for things? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I think it like obviously like it's different to like to do like the spaces. But every time I take like my family or like my aunties to someone's house, like, they're like, "This is amazing." Yeah. We did not know this was here, but they just don't motivate. They see like ads and they don't think it's for them. Yeah. But like, why do you think that people aren't like purchasing? Like, aren't seeking it out? I think theatre's always been quite an exclusive space. It's like, oh, we're going to the theatre. We're so cultured. Uh, so it's always been like that kind of space. And I feel like, so historically, the kind of audiences that go there just aren't those kind of people. And so even though now there's such a breadth of work that speaks to so many different audiences, but if historically you've been excluded from a space, you're not just going to start going there because even though tickets might be like £10, it's sort of like, well, I could go to this for £10 and I trust that thing and I know that I'm going to enjoy it. Or I could go to this huge building in the middle of nowhere to see something that I've never seen before and that feels like a risk. I think it can feel dangerous as well going into a space where you think nobody else is going to be like me. Yeah, You know, I've got friends who are black actors who say Edinburgh is a challenge. Susan McCombs talked about it on this show before. She's talked about it and she said, I steal myself in Edinburgh, get my cappuccino. I think, no, I'm allowed to be here. I went to RADA. Why can't I be here? I'm allowed... She said, but she's standing in the queue. She's dark skinned black woman. She's the only black person there. And she said, no, it is intimidating sometimes. And I absolutely get that. And friends of mine who went to a play... And they said they were the only white people there because it was a black play, and I guess they had reached out and found a big black audience. They said, "Oh, it was, you know, it was weird being the only white people." And it was, <laughs> anyway, they said, really, 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 exactly. "Oh no, exactly. Yeah. But, exactly." And I said, "Isn't that good though? Because you know what it's like for black people to yeah. rock up to the national, and even when it's a black play at the national, where everyone on stage is black." Nearly all the audience is white. Yeah. yeah. And so what you're doing is ingenious because you're going, you are allowed to come to this. Here's a free ticket. We're all going to meet the there together. In the stalls as well. Yeah. The good seats. You can't we're, have crap seats. We're, you're going to have a good seat in the stalls. We're all going to be together. You're safe. You can walk into this building. Here it is. This is where you find it. It's going to be fine. And then once you've been a couple of times, then you go, oh, actually, I want to see that. Oh, actually, mm-hmm. I'm interested in that. Or I might want to participate. And Coco, I want to throw to you now because I think what you do is remarkable because... 
I think what Sophie and I do, there is somewhat of a barrier in people's minds with stand-up comedy of like, what if it isn't funny? And then what if people don't laugh and it's terrifying? And the thing is, stand-up isn't terrifying, but I understand why the barrier's there. And I think what you're doing is saying, as long as you've got something to say, here is an art form, you don't have to have a huge cast, you don't have to hire a special fancy theatre. Even if you were bedridden, even if you were home with five kids and no way out of the house, you know, you could make a YouTube video of you expressing your thoughts in spoken word. And so that's why I think it's a very, very powerful medium. Could you tell us more about how you got into it and how we could get into it? Yeah, I mean, I kind of just fell into it. I grew up doing theatre, specifically musical theatre, and then lost love of that because the industry is very... Um, And so I stopped doing musical theatre... And was like, oh, I don't want to perform anymore. But there was always been something creative in me. And I was like, what is it? What do I want to do? Do I want to do cabaret? Tried that. I was like, mm, not very good at it. Don't do that. And then I was like, what about this, that and the other? And I kind of just fell into spoken word because I like words. Like, I'm not an amazing linguist. And, you know, there are lots of people who are so much better with words than I am. But I just, that's the way I found to express it. So I kind of just fell into it that way. You're an incredible wordsmith. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's imposter syndrome. Anyone else got that? Oh, mate. I, yeah. I'd be a fake if I said I had it. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Don't feel my imposter syndrome is nowhere near as bad as yours. And I just feel embarrassed to say that I have it. Oh. It's not that bad. <laughs> I think you're a real wordsmith, but also I think you're really getting to the heart of something. And you really cut. When I saw your show White, which was about being mixed race and feeling as white as you were black and then having the world project, you know, you're not yeah. white. It's a, such a moving show and it really made me understand more about the mixed race experience that I hadn't understood before. But how do you take that first plunge? Like, what skills do you have? Into writing a thing. Yeah, writing it and saying it out loud. Like, I would say to anyone who has any form of creativity, which I believe is every human being in the world, if you've got some creativity in you and you can put it down in words or something, just do it because you have something to say. Like, my thing was, I want to say something about being mixed raced because I didn't feel like there was enough stories about that at the time. And so I just wrote things about being mixed race and they kind of ended up being a show. And it doesn't have to turn into a show. Like, you can write things down and just share it with your partner or your friends or your kids as bedtime stories or whatever. Especially with poetry and spoken word, it's something that if you never want to share it, you don't have to. But it's such a great thing to do and to get out there. And if you want to share it, like you said, you know, you can share it on YouTube. You can have a SoundCloud where you just post a little iPhone or Samsung or any other phone. We don't have other phones, phones are available. Other phones are available. <laughs> <laughs> you know, voice note recordings or whatever. You just have to think about what you want to say. And everyone inside of them has a story or has something they want to say or has something that just really pisses them off. So just write that down. And then just make it rhyme a little bit or add some repetition <laughs> in there. That's how you, know, you write a Those poem. are the cheat codes for it. And then you, know, you can add more things. Jessica Regan <laughs> has been doing big speeches workshops for us, which is meant to be a sort of about how to deliver like a Henry V speech. Because it's, you can't be apologetic with your body when you're saying, once more to the breach. It's just impossible to come out and go, oh, I just had a thought about going into the breach. Um, <laughs> and thought perhaps we could do it. I mean, we did it before, didn't we? We no reason we can do it again. But that's sort of what I thought. But just pop it on the table in case anyone's interested. Um, you can't do that you have to say once more into the breach but what I found interesting is I went to some of the first workshop and she was getting the women who were on it to mash up stuff of their own with some of these powerful speeches and it was remarkable and then she said look you can just do one of the formal ones or you can do one that you've written inspired by this and everyone did their own and I thought that was so interesting that it became more of a self-expression workshop yeah, when you start performing, and I don't know if you found this with spoken word, like you kind of be like, you write stuff for yourself, but then you're like, I'm going to show it to people. And then you're like, but how do I do that? And you're like, I'm going to pretend to be someone. So I'm going to pretend to be mm-hmm. like giving this big speech. And I wanted to ask you like how you found your voice. Because like when, like I, when I was younger, I decided that I wanted to do poetry, but I was like, okay, I need a beret. I need a... <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need to say things right. in a kind of syncopated <laughs> rhythm. I need to make things rhyme a little bit. And I was like, yeah, do some snaps. Tur- snaps. A turtle neck snaps as well. Snaps. Good snaps. Yeah. Apparently that is mix, how yeah. you write a poem. But uh, yeah, like how do you get out of, like not copying other people, but how do you find what you want to say the way you want to say it? I think for me, it was falling out of love with something that I really loved, which was performing and then finding my way back into it another way. And I'm not saying, like, fall out of love with the things that you love to hopefully love it more, but it was falling out of love with it and then kind of going, hey, I have to kind of unlearn a lot of things, which is just something that you need to do as humans, I guess, as well, is, you know, you have to unlearn a lot of things. And I had to unlearn, you know, all poetry rhymes. 
and stuff like that. I kind of found my voice just by doing it a lot, just by writing a lot and kind of going. I did start off when I first performed. I've got a poem called Not All Men, which is about the hashtag Not All Men. And it always gets a reaction. I would have done it here, but I was like, ooh. Um, <laughs> um, so I've got that poem. And when I first started doing it, I was doing it like spoken wordy, like, you know, not all men. No, like, you know, the tombra that like spoken word, because I was like, that's how you do it. You know, there's a rhythm and it's like this when you emphasize the things. You know? And I was like, oh, my God, this feels so dumb. This feels like I'm acting and it's like it's not fair and it's not fun. And so I just kept saying things aloud and I'd find my own rhythm. And I'd, when I was writing, I'd find my own things that I like. Like, I really enjoy repetition. Like, I look back at all my poems, I'm like, do I have no original thoughts? They just keep going. And so I just kept doing the things until I found what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. Well, you are definitely succeeding. And I'd love you to come and teach a workshop for the Guilty Feminist, actually, if you'd be interested. Yeah, to, I'd yeah. love that. I would go that. If anybody... Um, yeah, no, just for you and me in a room. <laughs> Anyone else? And, Toby, you are producing for The Bush right now. Yeah. What kind of work are you platforming and how can people get involved in if they wanted to write longer plays or pieces for more than one character, if they wanted to present a piece of work? Where's the gulf between I've never done anything like that and mm. this is going to appear on the stage? Like, wow. what are you looking for? The Bush is a new writing theatre, so we get a lot of plays and we've got to read a lot of plays. And I think when I'm reading a play, I really look for relationships. I think a lot of the dialogue can come from that. And I think sometimes there are unnecessary characters or necessary voices in a piece that could be interpreted in different ways. And I think I like work that's really experimental. I like work that is multi-art form. I think theatre is at a place now where you can do that stuff. And it's like, oh yeah, this is still theatre, as opposed to it being a very naturalistic mm. type play. I think there are lots of people doing kind of like one person shows and they're paying multiple people or using music and sound and lighting and technology differently. And I think when I read work, I like to see elements of that kind of experimenting of work and having different ways to tell a story that isn't kind of just narration based or there's a lot of plays that the dialogue is really similar, which is really like short and cutting. So it might be like between two people and it'd be like, hi, hey, I thought you were, yeah, but why? I don't, yeah. And I hate, I guess, I don't know why people do this so many of them. But what? (laughs) Hi, speak. They never like, they never say the thing. They just go on forever. And it gets on my nerves so much. Same as you. But like, I'm just like, say the thing. So I like plays that kind of just say the thing, but say it in an interesting way. Like it doesn't need to drag out through the whole play. And in the end, it's something that's really uninteresting and uninspiring. (laughs) So don't send a play like that in. Uh, (laughs) What plays could people read that you think would inspire oh, them as feminists as black women as queer women like do you have any plays that you would recommend women read oh my gosh if you don't say misty i'm gonna really question she's not on anymore yeah but it's still a play oh yeah read misty read misty that's a, yeah. a kenny that's a, an amazing play i feel like you miss a lot of it without it being on stage though because there's yeah, like a live band with it and it's amazing i love debbie tucker green she's my favorite playwright i think she's phenomenal she had a show on that was called ear for eye but all her work is, like, very poetic. Oh, see Nine Night. Nine Night is on at the moment as well at Trafalgar Studios. Nine Night. Nine. Yeah. Nine Night. And that's about the nine nights in a Jamaican family's wake. Is that right? Yeah, so the matriarch of the family passes away and they've got spoiler. a tradition where they do... Um, that's the opener. I mean, you kind of... Yeah. yeah that's, the op- <laughs> that's the opener. It's not a spoiler. Um, yeah. And so there's nine nights of mourning that happens. But there's so many other things that are part of that show and it's written really beautifully... And if we follow your Twitter, oh God, um, yes. you will recommend things that we should go and see. And there's all sorts of performances where you will feel welcome. You'll feel welcome if mm. you are a black woman or an Asian woman. You'll feel welcome if you are a queer woman. There are spaces where you will feel welcome if you're disabled. Don't look at the theatre and go, oh, not yeah. for me. Mm. There's lots of £10 tickets. If you are a young black person, you can get involved with the Black Ticket Project. And could you please tell us what you need from us as theatre makers, as people who just perhaps have some disposable income, they'd be happy to contribute. Mm. How do we get involved with the Black Ticket Project if we want to help? If you have a show that you think people should come and see, let us know. We're on Twitter. It's and we can contribute some tickets. So we can say yeah, so just like 10 tickets, 20 tickets. tickets, 100 tickets, whatever. We can yeah. give them to you and then you'll distribute them. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like 250 like it was with Nine Night, but like any amount of tickets that we can give. Because people are really 
eager to see stuff. Mm. Like, any time we post tickets, they get snapped up so quickly. And people can contribute to a crowdfunder as well? Yeah, we've got a Patreon and a PayPal. So we've got a Patreon if people want to donate right. monthly, any kind of amount. And then we've got a PayPal for, like, one-off donations So if you well. don't have a show you can invite people to, but you think, yeah, I'd give a tenner to that or 20 quid to that, and that will pay for a young black person to go to the theatre, you can give it to the crowdfunder. And where can we find that? What's your uh, website? Patreon.com slash Black Ticket Project. Great. And, and we can me, follow you at project. BT Project underscore. And there are other ticket projects, I'm sure, for young Asian people <laughs> oh, and <yeah>. young <laughs> white, what about white me, disenfranchised people. Sometimes Toby gets people going, but what about, what about you know, and Toby's saying all those things are valid and important, but what I'm doing is for young black people. And that's specific, but please find other ones or start your own. I'll but, donate to it as well. I've told people that and then they don't start one. I'm just like, well, they need to know. <laughs> Great. But we care, but not enough to do the work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But enough to say you're doing it wrongly. Coco. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, though, Jesus. Yes. Coco, I really would like to say that if anybody does want to get into theatre or if they want to watch theatre but they feel like the big ones are really scary, go to fringe venues. Small fringe venues like Oval House, like Bush, mm-hmm. like yeah. uh, The Yard, like... Mm-hmm. What's that? Theatre 503. Theatre 503, The Gate. Go to small fringe ones and you won't feel so like <gasps> about it, I think. I don't yeah. know. Start small. Yeah, try fr- and, Also support fringe venues because that's where all the br- yeah, best artists are. Bravely go. And do know the National Theatre is the National Theatre. It's not the National White Theatre. It's not the mm. National Posh People's Theatre. It's not National Theatre for people who were raised at the theatre. It's the National Fucking Theatre. And the Travel X <laughs> tickets are £10. So you can get on that website. You can go, I'm allowed in this building. Get some mates. Go in together. It's not actually scary. It's a really nice building. There's little theatres. There's big theatres in there. And you're allowed to go take permission, see and be seen. Sophie Duke, uh, where can we see more of you? Oh, uh, well, my handle is at Sophie Duke Box. Oh, if, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sophie, I was like, I didn't say anything. <laughs> hey. Uh, at Sophie Duke Box, if you DM me, I will happily send you nudes. Um. <laughs> when I said, where can we see more of you, Sophie? <laughs> Sorry. I didn't I'm bring that chat. literally. Uh, no, I, uh, I have a regular live show. It's called Wacky Racists. It's every second Sunday of the month. Uh, <laughs> Disclaimer, it's not an actual show for actually quirky racists. Um, That's to be clear. It's a very uh, fun comedy show. It's in King's Cross every second Sunday of the month. You can come. You can find it on Facebook. It's a wacky comedy club. Great. Uh, so find all of these amazing women online. Follow their work. Go and check out what Toby's doing at the bush. Go and check out everything Coco does. Follow her online. Go and check out Wacky Racists. Could you give a big, big round of applause for the wonderful Coco Brown? <laughs> the amazing Toby Cherry Martin. <laughs> and my co-pilot for this evening, the wonderful Sophie Juca. <laughs> we have been the Guilty Fabulous. Good night. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Fox's wife, guest co-host Sophie Duca, and our very special guests, Toby Cherry Martin and Coco Brown. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Zielinski for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Joanna, Martin, and everyone at the Leicester Square Theatre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Could you imagine if I was terrible? What if I'm terrible and it's just like, I'm like the token terrible one, they're like, oh, you know. I don't know now if this is just you talking all spoken word. (laughs) What if I'm terrible, but I don't know, maybe I'm terrible. I'm like, am I performing spoken word with you? I don't know. Everything everything is spoken word, if you try hard enough. (laughs) Everything, everything is spoken word, but is everything spoken word or is nothing word spoken? That's nuts. That's right. That's right. I'm having a um, go. How am I going to follow that? <laughs> right? Um, thank you. Really easily, I think. <laughs> so usually um, when I do poetry, I do it with my Luke Stage.